with the beast I'm touch. Do you know go to open the door? I'm Maureen Kerr, and it is my real privilege today and pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Katie Novak. Dr. Katie is going to be speaking to us today about the UDL, the Universal Design for Learning. I had the privilege uh, last, late last year to attend a workshop on UDL in Christchurch, and I could see huge opportunities. As educators, we all know that within any given class, there is a wide range of diversity, and how do we, how do we address these challenges? So, um, I think you will find the session today to be really, really interesting, particularly in terms of how we um, teach children, our students about God. Katie is currently the Associate Superintendent of Rockton Dunstable Regional School District. She comes with a, a, a 12 years of experience in teaching and administration, and lots and lots of enthusiasm and excitement. I saw the preview as we were starting. If later on there's an opportunity for questions, it's really important because this is a video link that you actually use the microphone. So we have, I think, two um, roving microphones. So if you wish to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand and um, one of the rovers will bring the microphone to you. Um, Katie will be able to hear, so she will be able, we will be able to see her on video link and the camera will pick up the audience. So she will be able to see you. I don't think she'll see me, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so, yes, I, um, please join with me in welcoming Dr. Katie Moe. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I love the nodding. Okay, perfect. So, I'm here today to talk a little bit about Universal Design for Learning and basically give you a brief introduction to what the framework is and then also talk about how you can begin implementing it with your learners. So we will start off. What I want to do to start off is to let you know that UDL fits in perfectly with what you're already doing. So a lot of the times when we talk about a new concept like UDL, Universal Design for Learning, there's this, this idea that possibly we're gonna have to reinvent what we're doing. Um, but UDL is really an umbrella that fits so nicely with things that we're already doing in the best part of our work. So what I did is I went online and looked at some of the 2020 uh, Beacon Goals and tried to align them to the UDL framework. And so I think this is a nice place to start off to show you that the work that you're doing that's so important to you really is just going to be, you're going to be able to, to implement this work and reach these goals in a more effective and efficient way if you implement them using Universal Design for Learning. So the first one, obviously the goal is to have you know, the same educational outcomes, the same quality outcomes for students regardless of their diversity or their variability. And so the, the connection here to UDL is really that there's a philosophical belief at our core in UDL that every single student is capable of having these really amazing outcomes. And we look at it as the structure of the, the curriculum and the way that we design and deliver our instruction, that is what takes away the barriers that prevent some students from learning. So that's a huge part of the framework and all of the different guidelines or strategies that UDL outlines to kind of deliver instruction speak to this need that this is for everybody. This is for the common good of every single student that we have because every student can learn a little more every single day regardless of where they start. So our students come to us as they are and we need to teach them as they are and move them ahead in life so they can you know, have a you know, beautiful life and they can learn and they can you know, participate in, in this global society. But this starts with where they are. And so UDL takes that into account and all the guidelines really allow students to be who they are without thinking about, oh my goodness, you know, this lesson is not going to be able to be accessible for the student. Instead, we look at it as, what can we do as educators to make sure that every student can access this lesson? The second goal is really about, you know, you're talking about the importance of these bicultural relationships. Um, we want to have, or we do have, a multicultural society. But what happens is there's specific guidelines that talk about the need for, regardless of what you're teaching at what level, that you need to really think about how to promote understanding across cultures. So that's an important part of the framework as well, is as you're designing, you're thinking about 
how do I have to explain this so we can bring everybody together? Because again, our students come to us from very many different places and we need to really consider that and build our curriculum around that. And then lastly, you know, we all want to make sure that our students are really committed to promoting good news and the, the, the quote that's used in the goal is actually from various dimensions. And that is what UDL is all about. It's about teaching and learning using various dimensions. So there's basically three different networks that we talk about in UDL. It's representation, which is the way that we actually teach the material. Expression, which is how students show us what they know. And then engagement, which is how do we get them to make it matter. So throughout, while we're teaching, we always need to kind of weave in the importance of this is why we're doing this, this is why this is important. And then when they're giving it back to us, when they're expressing what they know using these various dimensions, making sure that they realize why that is important. So that's at the core of UDL. So what I want to do throughout this presentation, because if I was there live, I would do this, is basically give you many opportunities to really reflect on, on what I'm saying so you can think about the questions that are important to you and that you can kind of talk to people around you. So periodically throughout this presentation, I'm going to give you some time and I'm going to say, you know, find a neighbor, feel free to switch seats, and talk for a couple minutes about what I said. Or if you're more comfortable working alone, you know, send a tweet or jot down some notes or just close your eyes and think. But to give yourself an opportunity throughout this next hour to really think about how this can be implemented within your practice. How you may have to shift the way that you're designing your curriculum or delivering your curriculum to maybe more closely align to UDL so you can reach all of your goals. So I want to start off with a, a dinner party analogy because I think this is really the best way to think about when students come to us, and whether you teach really young students or whether you're teaching adults, whether you're doing some professional development with colleagues, we basically can look at it as a big dinner party. And so imagine that you're having some guests to your house and you're going to prepare dinner. And what we do a lot of the times is we think back on to our strengths as a host. So I want to make food that I know that I'm, you know, I'm pretty I'm pretty good at making. I don't want to make something disgusting and try something new because it could totally fail. So what I do is, well, what works for me? Like, what do I know I can pull off? And then I create a meal and I deliver it to my guests. The issue is, is when we're thinking about this dinner party now, we have so many guests that come to us with so many different needs and it has nothing to do with them being picky eaters, for example. It's not that our students come to us and they don't want to learn because inherently, as humans, we crave knowledge. We, you know, we crave learning and, and moving ahead. But what happens is there's barriers that prevent our students from learning. And so when you're thinking about a dinner party, you would have to think about planning that party very differently if you looked at this guest list as opposed to, I'm having some friends over, so I'm going to kind of put out the food that I'm comfortable making, and I'm going to make sure that you know the decor is something that I'm comfortable using. So it's really interesting to think about your classroom in this way. On the first day of school, on the first day I know of a new unit, you know, whether your learning environment is online or in person, or you know, whether it's in school or whether it's in church, whatever you're doing to teach, people are coming to you with these different needs and these barriers are inherent in their diversity and in these in their variability. And our job is to eliminate those barriers by thinking about it proactively and intentionally at the beginning, what can we do so as we are teaching, as we are representing this knowledge to students, all of them can access it. So what I'm gonna have you do is just take literally one minute, and the tech team's gonna pay attention to me, I'm gonna make bizarre movements when the minute is done, but just let that soak in, think about it, and talk to a neighbor or jot down some notes just about that idea of starting over and planning before your guests come over for a party to make sure that everybody has equal access to your food. So one minute, you can start chatting.
in Boston, Massachusetts. It is 10 of 7 p.m. and it is 96 degrees outside. And you're in the future because it's Friday there. So I'm just sitting here in the past sweating while you're in this beautiful space. You know, you probably just ate breakfast. Oh, yeah. So this idea that we're looking at really this, this dining experience, we're looking at our students, to extend the analogy, as being really hungry for knowledge. Our students come to us hungry. Our guests come to us hungry. And it's really about making sure that we have food that they can eat. And not only that they will eat, but that it's really nourishing for them. So I could look, for example, you know, at, at one person and say, oh, well, you know, um, I could make sure that Lucy has lettuce, because she can eat lettuce. That's certainly true. What you don't want to do is go down to the lowest common denominator, um, which is sometimes what happens when you're thinking about, well, how can I do one lesson that all of these people can access? Sometimes the rigor is compromised. So what we need to think about is there's certain techniques we can use to make sure that if we have one meal, all of these people can eat it. So we're gonna kind of go through that a little bit in the next couple slides. So the UDL was basically born at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts by three professors over 30 years ago who were researching the how brains react to learning. And what they realized is there's basically three parts of the brain that light up regardless of the ability or the diversity or the variability of the learner. So the recognition, the recognition networks, this is where the representation comes in. As I'm talking to you right now, you, this part of your brain, this back part of your brain, where it's, where it's purple, the one totally on the left if you're not seeing the color, that's the part that is lighting up if you can take in what I'm saying. So, you know, right now, for example, this is on audio, so you need to be able to hear me for that recognition network to light up. So, you know, ideally, if you were not able to access the audio, there would be something like sign language or there would be captioning in the bottom, and that would allow you to therefore read it. But if you can't hear me right now, that recognition network would not be lit up as far as what I'm saying. Um, there, there is some visual material there on the projector. But that's the part of the brain that, that lights up when you recognize something or when a teacher is teaching and you're representing it. Now the second, the strategic network, that's the how of learning and that's a little bit deeper in the brain and that's when you give your knowledge back out. So, you know, I understand what you just told me, now I want you to talk about it with the neighbor or reflect on it or send a tweet. That's what I'm trying to get you to do to, to light up your strategic network or express that knowledge back. And then lastly, the effective network, when you go very deep into the brain, that's the why am I even doing this? Why does this matter? Why is this important? So that's why when I started with, this is work you're already doing, this is work you're already passionate about, and this is a way to do it. That's, that's a package where there's specific guidelines and strategies that you can use in order to meet these goals. And of course, there's many other goals both in what you're teaching just as a part of FACE and then also what you're teaching as far as the content and the knowledge that you want them to know. And all of this aligns to this idea that we need to light up the three parts of the brain. We always need to think about how we're designing, what we're teaching or putting out, how we're asking kids to give that back to us in ways that you know allow everybody to be able to contribute something. And then how can we get every student from every background to care, to realize that what we're doing is really, really important. Now, one of the common things that I hear as I'm presenting is universal design for learning is differentiated instruction. So as we're panning the room here, just nod, because I can see everybody, if you've heard that universal design for learning is exactly like or very similar to differentiated instruction. Can I see some nods or some shapes? Okay, I'm seeing some nods and shakes. Perfect, so there's a mix. So those of you who have heard that it, that it is similar, the, the difference really comes down to this idea of labeling students. So what happens in differentiated instruction? By definition, if you read the peer-reviewed research, is that you prepare different curriculum for different groups based on a perceived label. So I, I'm just gonna use very general terms that are dated, but we use the term, for instance, a struggling learner. And we would say, well, these students struggle, so I'm going to give them something that's easier. And then I'm going to say, these students are really accelerated, you know, they're very high performing, I'm going to give them something more rigorous. 
That is what differentiated instruction is by definition. And, and that's not to say that there's not really valuable things about that framework, because sometimes that is valuable, especially if it's flexible. If you're saying, okay, so today these students are struggling with this concept, I'm going to give them something different. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that as, as an instructional practice. What is different about UDL is the idea that everyone is getting the same thing at the beginning. So I'm not making choices as an, as an educator that would basically block a student from accessing certain parts of the curriculum. What I need to do is design a curriculum and then empower the students so they know how they learn best and they are able to then make choices for themselves that will allow them to learn. So instead of saying, well, this, this, this lesson here is going to be easier or it's going to be more acceptable and this one is more difficult or more rigorous, Basically, I can teach to everybody first, and then I can say, I want you to reflect on your learning right now and assess yourself. And based on this assessment, you know, I need you to choose one of the following things. And what we need to do is we need to provide feedback to our students and, and help them to learn how to learn. Because in differentiated instruction, a lot of it comes down to the teacher to make those choices for students. But then, if we're always making the choices, if we're always saying, you need the rubric, you need the graphic organizer. That engagement piece is missing about why do I need it. So to really inspire kids to know why they need these tools, why they need this technology, and then allow them to really advocate for themselves, that is now tapping into that core of the brain where engagement is really important, and it's also allowing them to feel better about their expressing their knowledge because there's not this stigma anymore of I'm forced to do this, it's saying, you know what? This is going to help you to be able to get here. So, you know, choose this so you have a really good understanding of it, and then you can move up. As opposed to, this is what you're doing over here, and this is what you're doing over here. So, how do we do this? This is all seems, you know, it might seem a little, you know, vague right now, but the, the really concrete thing about UDL is these guidelines. Now, you see that there are numbers, there are nine guidelines. You may also see these guidelines without numbers. The reason that the Center for Applied Science and Technology, that's CAST, that's the, the basically the think tank that came out of Harvard University, they've had numbers for years, but the numbers suggest a hierarchy. And so the new version of the guidelines, there are no numbers and they're in a different order because they wanted to say, you know, number one is not more important than number nine. These are just things that as you're designing your instruction, you really want to think about and say, okay, as I'm teaching, that's a representation column, that's how we want to light up that part of the brain where students recognize. If you look at the first one, we need to provide options for perception. And then underneath it, those are the checkpoints. Those are specific things that you can do in order to provide different options for perception. So again, I can customize the display of information by having a PowerPoint which then you can access afterwards. So you could make the font bigger if you wanted to. You could you know, slow it down. You could change the colors if the contrast wasn't right. So a lot of the times when you do things electronically using technology, it makes it much easier for individual students to customize that display. Also, again, you always want to have options for auditory and visual. So, Again, technology makes it easier to do this, although it is, is not necessary at all. You can do amazing things in the classroom with no technology and still allow for different visual and audio. So to really look at these, I'm gonna go over the nine guidelines and then give you time to just look at the checkpoints to think about that. So when you're looking at the first three for representation, again, you wanna provide different options for perception. So you always wanna think about, how can I make sure that students are able to access this. The second one is you always want to make sure that you're being really clear about the language that you're using, the symbols that you're using. This is really where it comes into providing some background knowledge. So if you're using vocabulary that is central to what you're teaching, you need to define that. If you have students that come from different language backgrounds, you need to provide a translation for that or a lot of visuals to go along with that. Um, you want to use multiple media because, again, that provides a different option to say, here's a manipulative, here you can, you can pick this up, you can touch this, you can learn about it, you can watch a video. And again, it provides background when language is a problem. Because if you are always speaking using language, students that have you know, a limited vocabulary or who have a, a harder time processing auditory information or even visual information in words, 
they have a better opportunity to access the information if you're using these multiple tools. And then lastly, you want to be really clear about making connections and highlighting big ideas and making sure that students know what to do with that knowledge. Okay, so I'm going to teach it to you, but I don't want to teach it to you in isolation where it's like, well, I know how to do this in the classroom. We want them to take this knowledge and their faith and go out into the world and use it. So always being really clear about, I'm teaching this to you because this is ultimately what you're going to do with it. I don't care necessarily that you know how to do it here. All of this has value for your life. You know, it's, we need to take this to the next level. We need to pack our bags with knowledge to move on. So this is really important. Then we need them to give it back to us. So the middle column really talks about we, this is where, you know, we need to make sure that they can physically give the information back to us. So things like speech recognition software um, and allowing, you know, different tools to record the voice, for example, instead of writing. When you go down to using multiple tools for construction and composition, this is, could be as simple as putting out highlighters and crayons and markers and pens and saying, choose your tool to write your response. Just giving them that choice increases the engagement in the brain, and it also, again, allows students to, to really express their knowledge in a way that is most comfortable to them. It seems like such a small thing, but you put out glitter pens, and suddenly the work just gets better. So it's all about these little tiny things. And then the last one really comes down to helping students set goals for their own work. What we want to do in UVL is teach learners to learn. We want them to know about themselves. What are their strengths and their weaknesses, not only as people, but as learners. So we can say to them, you know, what's your goal for this unit? You know, if, if we're assigning reading, you know, for, for homework or if we're assigning reading in the class, what's your goal for tonight? How much do you think is a reasonable yet challenging amount for you to read? You know, we could say, tonight I want you all to read for 15 minutes. Here's some strategies you can use so you are able to actually do that work. It's really getting into the metacognitive aspect of teaching and allowing kids saying, okay, just write a paper. The barrier there is, well, how do I do that? So giving students a lot of strategies of saying, this is what I would like you to do. I'm gonna give you as much choice as I possibly can, but I'm also gonna give you a lot of support. And then that last, the engagement is crucial. We need to recruit interest. We need to make them care. So this is any time we can make it relevant to their lives and talk about the things that are important to them. Anytime we can make it um, really heighten the idea of, of what is the goal, to be able to say, this is the ultimate goal, this is why you need to know this. Anytime we can give them feedback, really rich feedback, not good job, but I think you would be better off as a learner if you did this, always pushing them and having this mastery-oriented feedback. We don't want good job, we want them to move to the next level, so always really thinking about how we can mold them into that. And then lastly, we need to teach them how to cope when things get difficult. Life, as we know it, has challenges. And it's, it's not in anyone's favor to have students just go through and whip through everything really beautifully all the time, because we need to build up this character and this grit for life. And that UDL really accounts for that, is this perseverance, is how do you cope when things get tricky? How do you cope when things get tough? Again, we'd like them to be able to transfer these skills over, but this is a part of just teaching in general. It's not only about the content, it's about the way that we learn and the way that we persist and the way that we can overcome adversity. And you know, there's so many beautiful models within you know, the Bible that you can use to kind of teach these things. There are so many people who didn't give up. So what was their secret? What did they do? What can we learn from them? What can we do in the classroom? Because otherwise, we end up with this mindset of, well, I just can't do that work. You know, that's too hard for me. I can't do it. No, I believe all of you can do it. I'm going to teach you how. So these, again, are the guidelines that will help you to do that. So again, I'm going to give you kind of a mental time out here to, to either talk about it, to just read it on the screen. Um, if you want to go online and just Google UDL guidelines, they'll come up so you can see them on your personal device. But I'll give you two minutes to look this over and just to kind of think about it and maybe write questions that you might have. So when we go to the Q&A in about 25 minutes, you'll have them written down and ready to go. So two minutes, find a friend or just tweet or just reflect. It's totally up to you.
want this? Do you really want to know more about this? Where do you think the gap is? Let's talk about it. I always say as a teacher when I'm teaching students, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. Like if you took me out to a ski slope, I would feel miserably. And that's okay. Because I can tell you right now, the number one problem, I don't even know how to put on skis. And I'm comfortable saying that. So when you open yourself up like that to students, <coughs> they tend to say, you know what? I don't understand this. And you say, okay, this is great. So you have some different teaching instructions where you say, okay, let's slow down the pace of instruction. Let me give you some tips here. You know, let me have you work on something else. How are you doing? Do you need something different? And then the students are making the choice of saying, I still don't understand this. I might need something else. That's when we get even more intensive. And that's when we say, okay, so now maybe I need a specialized program to meet your needs. But what we've done is we, it's a new day. We have given them an opportunity to make choices for themselves about their own learning. And it sounds like it would be so much work to implement, but it's really not. Because what you do is you're, if you're teaching at the beginning and you're saying, okay, I'm going to use visuals, I'm going to use audio, I'm going to teach this the best I can. And then very early on after that mini lesson, you do something where you ask them to express their knowledge. And you can tell right away, okay, I have some students who are there. The worst thing we can do is continue to have them sit through a lesson of something of which they are already proficient in. So that's when we say, okay, now you have some choice to go work independently. You can continue working on this. You can collaborate. You can apply that knowledge. What we need to worry about is the students who are not yet proficient. So this allows us, this MTSS model allows the students who need our time the most to get the most intense instruction, while those students who are really becoming like almost stage two learners, if you think about the, the zone of proximal development, they're able to kind of help themselves they can then go on and move on. So that is the model of MTSS. And if you look around the circle, this requires a lot of evidence-based decision-making. So this is not just, you know what, I know that this kid is not gonna get this because he has trouble. It's saying, let's start a problem. And then you say, okay, you don't get that problem. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what got you stuck. Let's talk about maybe you're just getting frustrated or maybe you're literally missing content. And then you work with the students to help them to get a little bit further than they were when they came to you. So again, that's called MTSS. It would be, you know, feel free to research it. All states have their own model, but it's a really nice way to think about this idea of one of the things about UDL is, okay, so every kid is gonna get the same thing all the time. No, that's not true in UDL because different kids need variable levels of scaffolding and support, and this model allows for that. So we're going to reflect on UDL again, because like I've said so much to you in just 30 minutes. So you're going to have two two-minute opportunities, again, to discuss, to ponder, to tweet. So what I'd like you to do, because I can see everybody is all cramped up there, feel free to stand up if you so choose and actually go talk to someone else if you want, because you've been sitting for a while. So we'll do the two minutes, and then I'm going to do like switch, and then we'll do two more minutes. So you'll have four minutes to talk. So the first question, the first two minutes, is think about what you're currently doing. And what you're going to realize is the best part of your work, you're going to find a home in the UDL guidelines. So think about what are you already doing that aligns really closely to this? So you might say, you know what? I really do make an effort to represent my lessons using multiple means. That's where I'm really strong. Or I do a really good job every day of saying, OK, let me explain to you why this is important. And I'm going to allow you to respectfully ask questions of me if you don't think that what I'm saying is relevant. You know, you might say, I do that really well. So think about and celebrate what you're already doing to meet your goals that aligns nicely with this framework. So again, feel free to stand up, walk around the room, find a new friend, take two minutes to talk about this first question, and then we'll switch to a second question on the screen. So go right ahead.
And the second question, think about MTSS and change seats if you need to, turn around, get some stretching out, but find somebody you haven't talked to yet today and discuss MTSS in your practice for two minutes. to either read the words or listen to you. 
or if you do any kind of thing with a flipped classroom where they're on, you know, they're at home and if, they're, if there's access to technology, they can watch something online, like a video, or you send home a book and they read the book, having the option of an audio file, things like that. Also, we want to make sure that there's a lot of choices that are going to engage them and choices for how they're going to demonstrate their learning. Because there is no skill inherent in that content, they can show us what they know in countless ways. So if we just peek back for a second, if we want to know that our students are aware of the elements of, of celebration and worship, they could express that knowledge to us in a poem, by making a video, by writing a letter, by taking a multiple choice test, by um, making some sort of poster or PowerPoint or blog, you know, by making a string of tweets or Facebook posts. The possibilities are endless. So when you're thinking about this idea of choice, think about what is it that I really want my students to know at the end of this, and then giving them so many options for how they're going to express what they know. So we're going to be very flexible about the content. We're going to be very flexible about the engagement by saying choose something that is the most interesting to you. Within those choices, some are inherently more challenging than others. And then also we want to be really flexible about how we're going to assess that. One big question that comes up is to think about, well, how do you grade all of those things? And that could be just as, you know, you could do it proficiency-based by saying, if, if it's proficient, if, if you've met the standard, these things are going to be in it. So you, you know, it might be, there are at least three examples of celebrations. There are at least two examples from the class lecture about what was important about celebrations. You can quantify it like that. So it doesn't matter if it's a poster or if they're gonna do a live presentation or if it's a poem or if it's a prayer. They just choose what, what vehicle they want to deliver that knowledge back to you. That's different from the skills where they have to complete a task. So I can't say, we're going to express fractions. So you have a choice to make a video. It doesn't work that way. I'm responsible for teaching the fractions. So what I'm still going to do is be very flexible about the way that I teach it. So I have a textbook. I might have manipulatives. Maybe I'll show a video clip. But then also, I need to really scaffold. So that's where we talked about MTSS. So at the beginning, I say, OK, you know, everyone try to solve this first, um, you know, try to solve this equation. And then I say, OK, wow, you, you really have this down. You can keep going. If you feel like you're struggling, come over here. And I'm going to break down every step of the process for you. Again, the students who are already proficient do not want nor need that intense instruction or that intervention. But, but what we've done is we've given them an opportunity to reflect on their learning, to understand that they do not need that. So other students, in contrast, to be able to say, you know, what don't you get about it? The worst answer ever is like, so what is confusing about this? Everything. We don't want that answer. We want to say, well, let's talk about the different steps. I'm going to take you through the steps, and you're going to stop me at the step that you said, well, that, that one is confusing to me. And then say, OK, so explain to me. Where are you stuck? And give them the words. Give them the language. Clarify the vocabulary. Now you're only with a handful of students because your first lesson is going to meet the needs of most of your kids. And again, what we're going to do now once we can provide more intense instruction for everyone is you know, we give them a lot more mastery-oriented feedback because, again, those students who are already proficient, they're mastering a concept. We need to give the intensity to the students who are far behind to bring them up so they have very rich outcomes as well. So that's the difference between the content and the skills. So the question is, so as you're doing this, how do you make sure that the students are choosing the correct things? So when you're giving the choice, for when you're doing a content uh, assignment, and you're saying, OK, choose a poster, or you can write a letter, or you can do a poem, or you can, again, the possibilities are endless for this. That's a choice they have to make. On the contrast, when you're teaching a skill, it's do I choose to use the graphic organizers and to get more intense instruction, or do I choose to kind of work independently because I've reflected on myself? We need our students to know themselves as learners. So what I have found is the very best way to do this and to, make, to minimize the threats and the distractions in your class are to have them assess you frequently. The best thing that we can do, as you know, when you're teaching character, the best way to teach character is to be a strong role model with a strong moral compass and to have character yourself. 
If we want our students to be open to our feedback and know themselves as learners, we have to know ourselves as educators. So I would always say to my students all the time, I've taught you know, kindergarten all the way up to graduate school. What I would do at the end of a unit or at the end of a week or however it's comfortable for you is I would say, let's talk about this unit. Let's talk about your outcome. I want everyone to reflect on the grade that you got on this assessment, whatever the assessment is. And I want you to think about what could I have done better so you did better. That's a really scary thing to open yourself up to. And even kids in kindergarten or little, little guys, preschool, they will give you an answer. You talked too much. Oh, okay, thank you. I didn't like that book. Oh, that's interesting. So what I would do is say that, but I would, I would really try to model. So what you're saying is that I was weak <laughs> at this. What do you think that I could do better? And we'd have this really rich conversation where I was basically modeling myself as learner. Hey, it's okay that you're not good at everything. You know, I need to have this growth mindset as well. Like, I'm struggling with this. You need to help me cope. You need to give me strategies so I don't do this to you again because it's my job to make sure that you learn. I would say, were you engaged in this lesson today? Why or why not? Like, I really want to know. I'm not going to be upset. You know, and we, you obviously have to model how to give warm and cool feedback. So, you know, what you don't want students to say is, well, you're, I had a student once, this was amazing. I was teaching a lesson and he was making an origami crane. And I said to him, and again, this just showed how, how I really encouraged them to give me feedback and this reflects on my instruction. I said, right now, buddy, we're not gonna be doing the origami crane because I'm talking. And so he looked up at me and I said, I'm just trying to understand here. Like, think about why are you making that crane? And he looked at me dead in the eyes and said, I'm making the crane because this is painfully boring. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, thank you. And again, to know that he felt that he could say that to me, and that was maybe a little, you know, we talked about, well, there's nicer ways to say that. Um, what I came down to was, I was being boring. I got on this tangent and I was just going and going and going. And to really say to the students, I need you to know yourself. I need you to be comfortable enough with yourself to say, in order for me to get this outcome, I need to realize that I need more instruction. And the best way, again, to do that is to, for you to say, I am not that great at this. There are things that I am not great at. I am willing to work on them and learn just as I want you to learn. So that's really important. So basically, the long and short here, to come down to the last slide, the final thoughts are, when you're thinking about UDL, and again, I could go on, I could teach, I'm teaching a 40-hour course on UDL this summer. Um, so this is just a little tiny, tiny piece of where this comes in. But it, it will introduce you to the concepts. You can always email me, you can reach out to me. There are so many amazing resources on the cast.org website, so that's C-A-S-T.org. They're the gurus. Um, there's so many different things. And again, feel free to contact me anytime. But what it comes down to is, is, is thinking about your students. They're coming to you as they are. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to value them and you want to value their personal stories. And so to do that, you want to really think about all the different ways you can present it to meet their needs. To think about, if I'm teaching content, what are all the different ways that I can allow them to differentiate what they know? And again, this means the different tools they use for writing or allowing them the assistive technology for text-to-speech and just allowing them to have a choice about the poster or the, you know, the song or to you know, play an instrument in class or to do a, an artistic painting and then to give a presentation about what it means. If you're doing a skill, you cannot allow them the same freedom, but you can still allow them to make choices about what they need to be able to meet the goals. And then lastly, at the core of this is why are we doing it? At the beginning of every class, if there's one thing you take away, at the beginning of everything you do, say, this is the goal for today, and this is why it's important. Does anyone have any questions? And that's a really great way to start a lesson, because you can say, if you feel like this isn't important to you, please, very respectfully, I want you to tell me, because I need to make a connection to you, because if I don't, no matter how brilliant the representation portion is, or how engaging you feel that the expression is, is if they don't care, you're not gonna get their best work and you're not gonna get their best self. So this is all about not only building knowledge, not only building skills, but building their character and building them up as learners. So whatever they choose to do in life, 
they know how they can be successful. So I am right on time here. We have 15 minutes left for question and answer. But first, I just want to give you one minute to kind of, again, the last time, touch base within and among yourselves. You know, if you have a question, if, if you think that someone, a neighbor can maybe answer it first, and then uh, I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you have. So just take one more minute, talk to a neighbor, just kind of let this all set in, mingle around, and then feel free to ask me your questions. So just one minute. Saying, okay, you brought in your summative assessment today. 
you know, what I want you to do is take some time and reflect on your learning, reflect on the strengths and weaknesses against the criteria of the rubric. I would go through each element and explain, this is what I'm looking for for permission, and then I'd leave a box. Write for me the exact evidence where you did this. So if it's a video, you would say, you know, two minutes and 13 seconds into the video, I did this. So when you are looking at it and, and you're trying to do the criteria, you can basically get through it in about the same amount of time because you, you look at their rubric, you see the product, and then you either agree or you disagree. And I found that the more I did it, the more I agreed with their assessment of themselves. And sometimes they were much harder on themselves than I was going to be. Um, I would say, no, 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 you actually were proficient here. And they'd say, no, I wasn't. I was needs improvement because you said that you were looking for this and I didn't really do it. So that is one way if you wanted to try it just once. Um, it's a good way to start out to say, you know, I need you to reflect on your progress. I need you to monitor how you did. I need you to reflect and assess. It shouldn't always be me. Like, you should know the quality of the work that you're putting in. And then I can use my feedback to say, yes, you're correct. And that's what I would do. I would just put a check mark, meaning I agree with your grade. And those people who are very far off, they needed more intensive mastery-oriented feedback where I would actually end up writing a lot on the rubrics because they were not understanding the expectations for their work and they weren't doing a very good job of reflecting on their own learning. Thank you. 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 Uh, good morning, Katie. Brendan from Carmel College, University College of Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, a lot of us have been encouraged to use a software program called Turnitin, um, which yes. assesses the authenticity of our student work. Um, mm -hmm. I guess there's a component of that that involves self-review, where a student can actually submit their assessment and determine the authenticity and then change what is submitted. Um, there's also the opportunity for loading the rubrics. Um, so I'm just interested in your experience of that particular website program, how it fits in, and what potential there is in terms of e-learning, online stuff, um, for student assessment and self-review. Um, I, so I've been teaching online courses um, for 11 years. Um, at a university out here, and we also use Turnitin. <laughs> so um, basically what you do is you set it when you set it to draft, as you know. They can go in and they can actually see what's plagiarized. And that is a really amazing tool to have them self-reflect. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a research paper. You can do the same thing, you know, if you were able to allow them to do a little bit more of a creative work with their, you know, with a poem or with a letter or something like that. Um, if it's a video, you could say you can do a video and then annotate it and, and hand in the annotation. And what I always just say to them is if it's, in quote, if it's blue, it better be in quote marks. <laughs> because if you're using someone else's words, you know, you need to cite it. But I think that's an amazing tool that really speaks to, number one, allowing students to self-reflect, but it's also helping them as learners to know their tendencies towards possible plagiarism. Because a lot of the times, if you look at Turnitin in its best light, I would like put things in when I was getting my dissertation and I realized there were things that in my own head I was, I was paraphrasing, but they're really close. And it's good to be able to say, okay, I need to watch myself as a learner, you know, when it gets to that. So it is a tool that I think very much aligns with the Universal Design for Learning Framework. Um, the way that we make um, online courses and e-learning a little bit more universally designed is to start embedding that choice for assignments a lot more. So what I do for a lot of assessments, I used to always do just short papers. I teach a course called Rap, Rock, and Poetry, which teaches traditional poet poetry through music. So um, you know rappers and, and you know legends of the world like you know Bob Dylan. And so we used a lot of their lyrics. And so I used to have them always write three papers a year. That was it. It was you know in in a certain format. It needed to meet a certain word count. And I've moved away from that. And now they can do their response via podcast, or they can do it by um, creating just you know uh, an audio recording. They can do it by doing a collaborative Google Doc with another student. They can create a Prezi and present it with a voiceover. So I do now allow more of those options. When again, when the skill is not writing, if the skill you're looking for is writing, 
then turnin.com is the only way to go because we want to teach kids about you know making sure that they are doing appropriate copyright. But if it's if the skill is not writing, if the skill is knowledge, for example, I want them to understand about celebrations. There's nothing that that basically requires us to do that written paper and then put it through turning it. So it's again, it, it's starting small. You can't go, you know, from zero to sixty immediately. So it might be okay. Once during the semester, I'm going to allow students instead of doing this paper that goes through Turnitin, I'm going to do an assessment where they can do a podcast or where they can do this, and then I just ask them to do a paragraph annotated version, you know, that you can put through a Turnitin or something like that. If, if it's a college policy that you need to follow, but there's many other ways for students to express what they know, and it's also a lot more difficult to, for instance, plagiarize something like a podcast where you really have the student's voice. And personality come out, and there's not that reliance again on. I'm so stressed about meeting the criteria for this skill. I don't have time to learn the content. You're saying I don't care about the way you express it. Just learn the content. So you're taking away a lot of the barriers that kind of prevent students from being successful in showing their knowledge because they're so worried about kind of the double jeopardy of. He's he's, he's saying he's testing the content, but he's really going to grade the paper and the language convention. So this is what kind of brings up the threat and the distraction of the paper. So if you can only do it once or just for a small assignment, it's kind of fun to start to play with and to think about how can you add it into e-learning little by little. I think there's only I think we have one oh two minutes. Final question. Shop to a close. Katie, thank you so much. That has been really inspiring and very, very relevant for the work that we're doing here in New Zealand. And it's great to be able to converse with you across the other side of the world. Um, yeah. So thank you and good luck for, the, for your work in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much.